Let's talk about Kasumi. She's weird. Not in the quirky, oh my god, she could eat so much food when she's so tiny kind of weird. No. Since the moment Persona 5's enhanced port P5R had its first trailer, this new Phantom Thief has been the topic of most of the discussion about the new game, for better or for worse. But overall, most of the talk about her has been positive. In fact, she's almost the first thing to come to your mind when you think about the new game, and it shows how effective this character is as a marketing tool. She's plastered around all the promotional media and the highlight of every trailer so far. The sheer amount of literal spotlight this one character is receiving has got to make some others at least a little bit jealous. But despite being surrounded by so much positivity, I'm just a little suspicious of exactly what role Miss Yoshizawa will play in Persona 5 Royal. We know for certain that she is a phantom thief, but is that really the full extent of her involvement with the game's narrative? I don't believe that for a minute. This is not a spoiler video or a theory video. This is really just my educated guess on one possible plot progression for an upcoming game in a franchise I'm rather passionate about. Although, I suppose proper branding is in order, so... Hello, Internet. Welcome to Game... Hypothesis. Wait, so I already got that one? Internet, welcome to Game... Query. Also, spoiler warning for these games. I want to restate again. I've never played Persona 5 Royal. However... I do have an extensive understanding on how Atlas produces games, their general pattern for writing characters and settings for those characters to interact with, and how they incorporate a leitmotif into most if not all of the characters in their present game. But I'm not going to lie to you either, and say I'm 100% factually correct on this one. At the end of the day, I'm just some idiot from Florida. Are you, are you filming? I just kind of have a good grasp on how Atlas does things, or at least I'd like to think I do. For example. The hair color and clothing of the Persona 4 characters were chosen to fit a TV color calibration test because of the heavy emphasis on TVs in the story. Or that, in Persona 3, the reason Takaya's persona is Hypnos is because of a theory the artist heard where human bodies are relieved of stress while asleep. Since Takaya's ultimate goal is to relieve everyone in the world of their worries by forcing them to die, his persona's name and appearance reflects this. Hypnos, shown having a sleeping mask forcibly latched to its face, to drive home the idea. Point being, almost nothing in these games are decided on a whim. Multiple drafts of not just character artwork, but personalities, locations, and entire arcs of the game are well planned out to ensure they all fit whatever type of story the creator is trying to tell. So even though we don't have every single key detail of Kasumi, we can glean a lot based on just her persona's appearance alone, or at the very least speculate. After taking a lot of time to plan, I've devised two very likely theories for Kasumi's character growth. One, which is tame, the presumed way I think the events of the game will go, and the other being a bit more abstract, but still sharing some key ideas here and there. To get a better idea on how I came up with this idea in the first place, I went back to the first time a new social link was added into the Persona series, in 2007 with Persona 3 FES edition. Igis, while always being a party member in the original game, only has a social link in this enhanced version, where she's given the Aeon Arcana. In vanilla Persona 3, Metatron was a member of the Sun Arcana, but in FES, was switched to being the reward for completing Aegis' new social link, and from this point forward, a pattern had been established. In the next remake, Persona 4 Golden, Marie, while not a party member like Aegis this time, was still a new character whose social link was again of the Aeon Arcana, and upon completing said social link, the hero unlocked the ability to fuse Kaguya, another Persona with a high affinity for light attacks, similar to Metatron. So why did Atlas choose these Personas to reflect completion of the Aeon Arcana? It's very possible they just felt like they'd fit the characters, but I'd like to suggest another explanation. By comparing similarities between the mythological characters and the Persona characters, we again start to see some patterns at play here. Igis is an android with a metal body, who struggles with wanting to become more human. This is not the case for Metatron, who was a human named Enoch, who discarded his emotions and human body to ascend as an angel. In the mainline SMT games, he's also depicted as a robotic servant to God. Basically, they're polar opposites. With Marie, she's an amnesiac, who's slowly trying to recover who she is, but upon remembering her purpose, decides to take her own life, so that mankind will finally be free of the fog that invades Inaba. Only after convincing her otherwise and defeating Izanami inside the TV world, do we learn that Marie is an avatar of Izanami, not too different than Ryoji and his goddess Nyx from the previous game. Kaguya, on the other hand, is from an oral tradition, 
The Tale of the Bamboo Cutter. In this story, Kaguya is a girl who was discovered in a thicket of bamboo and raised by human parents until one day it was discovered she was actually a princess and had to return to her family on the moon, leaving behind an elixir of eternal life. Kaguya and Marie are similar in that they are both aided by normal human beings and eventually are revealed to be key figures in Japanese history. But where Kaguya and Marie differ the most is that while Kaguya fled, Marie stayed taking care of Inaba as a weather girl on the local news. So we've established a few similarities and differences between the members of the Aeon Arcana so far. So what if a new Aeon girl was added to a Persona remake? Logically, it wouldn't be too big of a stretch to think that they would follow this pattern, right? Here's the thing. Kasumi Yoshizawa is the Aeon Arcana for Persona 5R. And this time, that's a big deal. What do we know about Kasumi so far? She is one, a user of what appears to be light attacks. Two, she's a part of the Faith Confidant. The Faith is not a card found in the standard tarot card deck, similar to how the Aeon Arcana is from a different deck of cards. This Confidant also has five ranks, meaning the chances of it changing at some point in the story is incredibly high. And three, just like Marie, she appears to have her own palace centered around her character in the first promotional video. All other Phantom Thieves, even Goro, are seen escaping a crumbling palace, except for her. So what is in Kasumi's palace, and how will this affect the resolution of Persona 5R? Here's the point in the video where I'll give you another warning. I have not played the game yet, at all. But if I'm correct, and you get mad at me, that's all on you. You don't come crying to me about spoiling a game I've never even played, okay? I'm just throwing out educated guesses here, but I have strong reason to believe inside of the new unknown palace, Kasumi will discover that she is the goddess Sophia, the mother Aeon and creator of the Demiurge. Okay, this is gonna get a little funky, but what if I told you there is basically biblical fan fiction? Gnosticism is just that, a culmination and modernization of these ancient beliefs, and Atlas loves to reference them in some of their games. Atlas Faithful at some point have probably encountered a demon going by the name of Demiurge. In said games, he is a false god who claims he created everything in the material world and demands humans pay him tribute. Your party disagrees and kicks him in the dick. In real world Gnosticism, he's right, actually. But only kind of. See, way back, like 100 AD, here, a small fraction of the world did believe in the Demiurge and did believe that he created everything in our material world. But unlike modern day religion, creating everything wasn't seen as such a good thing. To summarize, the Demiurge made all of the world selfishly for him to control. Disease, death, war, and natural disasters. These were all carefully constructed to make humans fear the Demiurge and worship him so that he would protect them. But the teachings of Gnosticism tell us that this is a foolish thing to do, because it's said that all matter created by the Demiurge is inherently evil. The world we live in is flawed and wicked. The only issue is the true God that created everything, even the Demiurge, is unknowable. This God is also known as the Monad, or the One, but we'll just say Monad because it's easy. Okay, now I will try to explain the Gnostic creation of the universe using, uh, you guessed it, memes. So in this religion, if you don't want to be a bad, uh, it's the wrong layer, if you don't want to be a bad boy or a good girl, wait, what? If you don't want to be a bad boy or a bad girl, that's what I'm trying to freaking say, so this picture is irrelevant now I think about it, you got to get closer to Monad. But how the crowd are you gonna do that if you can't even interact with them? Well, this is where the Aeons came into play. Yes, those Aeons. So the Monad, right, created uh, these Aeons to interact with our human world, which now exists, personified here by the tortoise with the freaking thing. One of them just so happens to be, uh, I don't know, maybe you heard of them, Jesus Christ, that's right. The other one being a goddess, Sophia, who's not nearly as popular, but still important. Why is she important? Shut up and listen, I'll tell you. There are other other aeons, but they don't matter, so who cares about it? So we got our main characters, Monad, a god so powerful you can't even see him because they don't exist, but they also do, so they'll just be depicted as the default white layer in Photoshop, okay? Then you got Sophia, who is now pregnant. How did that happen and who was the father? Don't worry about it. During this time, there's also Jesus, but now that I'm checking my notes, he's not actually relevant to the story, so I'm, I'm just gonna put him over here. And lastly, you have Demiurge, the guy I won't shut up about. Plot twist, Demiurge is actually <gasps> Sophia's baby, but instead of crying like a normal baby, he decides to just, I don't know, create the entire 
entire world. Wait, is that why he has a diaper? Holy frick, I just noticed that. But while Demiurge was creating the material world, he also created a being known as Satan Isle, who's like the hidden unlockable character in a fighting game, okay? So while Demiurge was doing all that crap, Sophia was behind the scenes and also in the bottom layer, so you can't even see her. Now, she gave all the humans also knowledge that, uh, the monad exists, okay? Demiurge had no idea this was going on, because I guess you can't know about an unknowable god unless you're Sophia. She's She just, like, doesn't play by the rules. One day, though, Demiurge got sick of scaring humans with famine and crap all by himself. So he was just like, you know what? I'm going to make angels, and they're going to help me out and do stuff. One of them angels was all like, yo, is you, like, the real god and stuff? And Demiurge was all like... Yeah, of course I am, bro. What do you- <laughs> come on. But that one angel was sus about all that. So we checked his iPhone 4 and found out that he lied. And then he started a rebellion against Demiurge. That one angel's name was, you guessed it, not Pikachu, Satan. Satan Ale. They're the same guy. Did he win against Demiurge? I don't know. You tell me. So what did that have to do with literally anything? Well, Demiurge is another name for Yaldabaoth, Persona 5's final boss, and if you also consider Saint Nile is Joker's ultimate Persona's name, the parallels are as obvious as this video is long. But that begs the question, where the heck is Sophia? In the game, if she is such a critical part of the Gnostic belief system, the answer is Kasumi. In some tellings, Saint Nail was only victorious in defeating Yaudabaoth by restoring the knowledge of Monad that Sophia had placed in sight of humans long ago. This is a direct parallel to the final showdown in Persona 5 with, uh, some creative liberties taken, of course, since it's a Japanese role-playing game. But after Yaldabaoth gets tired of getting kicked in the dick for 30 minutes, he just kills everybody. But because humans resist being controlled by Yaldabaoth, Saint Nail shows up and then saves the day. Kasumi's card, also being the faith, has strong ties to knowledge and understanding the world around you, while the inverse meaning of the card was attributed to believing in false idols. And by definition, Demiurge is as false of an idol as you can get. I have no doubt in my mind that Kasumi is either Sophia directly or an Aeon sent from the heavens to make sure the God of Control does not go unchecked. But what about after that? It's in my belief this is when P5R's new major content will start. We already know the major selling point of the game, along with Kasumi's inclusion, is that winter will now be a playable season. This was also a feature in Persona 4 Golden, but there is a major difference in these two games. P4's final encounter is in March, no matter which version of the game you play. But now, in Persona 5 Royal, the game won't reach its climax at the exact same point. Consider the following. If Yaldabaoth was originally intended to be the Amino Sagiri equivalent to Persona 5, a fake-out final boss of sorts that opposes the player, it's not too difficult to believe that P5R's real final battle will be encountered in one of the new months Atlas is adding to the game. The original P5 spent many years in development. It isn't a stretch to think that maybe some corners had to be cut to meet deadlines, so with P5R now releasing, Atlas now has the chance to implement ideas they didn't have the time to include originally. I want to believe this because, one, I just don't really like Yaudabaoth. It's nothing personal, but he's just kind of boring conceptually and borrows way too heavily from other final bosses in the series mechanically. But despite my bias, I can't ignore his role in the story being a well-thought-out inclusion. You know, if the idea of being betrayed by a character you thought was your friend is getting a little old for the games directed by Katsura Hashino. In Persona 3, it was Akutsuki, who was secretly trying to summon Nyx and end the world. Why, I don't really remember, but then, in Persona 4, Adachi was revealed to be the mastermind behind the murders in Inaba. P5 decides to take things further by having not one, but two traitors. The first being Goro Kechi, the true culprit behind the mental shutdown incident, and the second being Yaudabaoth himself, who is posing as Igor, the mascot of the series. Even non-Persona games have a similar issue of almost becoming formulaic. Catherine, sharing the same director, has a similar twist, having the villain always hidden in plain view only to find out at the end of the game's climax that they were the bad guy after all. So when a new character is introduced in a remake of a game, which logically now needs a new final boss, since it's longer than the original, what do you think they're gonna do, given their previous track record of writing? Here are my two theories. Route A, Kasumi is an avatar of Sophia, and teams up with your party to defeat her other self, as Sophia becomes enraged after you punch her dick in the sun for 30 minutes. In Route B, Kasumi is Sophia still, or at least an avatar, but there's some even stronger force at play. Perhaps Monad that needs to terminate Kasumi, now that Yaudabaoth has him dealt with. But the Phantom Thieves dislike this, and now shift their focus to this new, unknown force that seeks to take their new friend away from them. 
perhaps being personified as the new character, Takuto Maruki. Going in order, Route A has very much what you'd expect from the Persona series, almost an exact carbon copy of the sequence of events from Persona 4 Golden. In this scenario, Amino Sagiri is Yaudabaoth, while Marie is Kasumi and Izanami is presumably Sophia. This would even match up with the goddess motif Atlas has going with Persona 3 and 4, with the final encounter being a goddess with major importance to their respective belief systems. Marie has her own dungeon dedicated to her, and Kasumi has her own as well, where she apparently learned something about herself, judging by her expression. While it is possible anything could be the final obstacle for the Phantom Thieves, I believe Sophia is the most logical choice, since we know for certain some new climactic event will happen at the end of the game's journey. I, for one, hope I'm wrong, but I don't think I am. Being able to predict the outcome of a game you've never even played kind of sucks, but I think Atlas kind of wrote themselves into a corner. By choosing to have Gnosticism as your background mythology focus, and having your narrative be a parallel to the events of the Gnostic belief system, there are only a few different directions a story like that can take, without going against your pre-established themes. Just think about it. If you were in Atlas's position, you need a new final boss for your game, would you go with something similar to your past works that fans would be pleased with, or something new, totally different, that doesn't mesh well with the visions of the previous director? Sure, this isn't saying anything concrete, and the ending of the game could very well just be out of mouth transforming into an even larger cup for the heroes to just repeat the same process of defeating them again. No one can really say for sure. It could be anything, but my point is to think critically on the most likely candidate. If I were a Japanese video game designer, and needed to pull a figure from Gnosticism to be the final obstacle for my video game, Sophia is the most likely candidate since she's the most well-known thing about the religion other than Demiurge, which Atlas has already used. Route B will be my counter-argument to my own theory. I feel that this is always something that should be taken into consideration when developing any form of analysis like this. The assumption that I am clearly wrong and this is why, or Devil's Advocate for short. Let's be real about this. What's your favorite villain in the Persona series? Chances are, if we're talking about the modern games, it's not a girl. In Persona 5, only two of the eight palaces are headed by a female, Futaba's palace, which calling her a villain would be interesting, and size, which is more appropriate, except not really. Point being, Atlas seems almost afraid to make a female character a villain, be it for marketing or merchandising reasons, I'd assume. We haven't had a true female antagonist since Chidori, after all, so I'm skeptical of them using the biggest thing pushing their software, which is Kasumi, for them to just turn around and betray the player and make her out to be the true villain. I mean, depending on how good of a job they do, and if they do go with my Route A theory, all of that Kasumi merchandise might just stay on the shelf forever. Inversely though, depending on the level of writing, Kasumi's betrayal could be a highlight of the game, and increase her popularity even more. For the sake of Route B, let's just assume Atlas doesn't want to take that risk, given how profitable Persona 5 is for them right now. So if Akechi is no longer the mastermind, if Shido is no longer the mastermind, if Yaudabaoth is no longer the mastermind because he doesn't have a dick anymore, that shit hurt who the heck are we left with? The student counselor, Takuto. He is even more low profile than Kasumi. All we know about him is he be sipping that juice, boy, and nothing more. Not even his confidence arcana even remotely lets us in to see what kind of person he is. Then what is his real purpose if he isn't in some way relevant to the story? Sure, there are other confidants in the narrative who you could argue are just there to support Joker, so we can buy items from, so we can talk to, but why him and why now? Seems a bit odd to add a completely new party member, make her relevant to the larger story of the game, have specific scenes to highlight just her and oh yeah, we got this other guy, don't worry about him. Again, I'm just skeptical. He could very well be a great guy who's just another confidant to clear if you have the time, but it's just too strange of a coincidence to ignore. Adachi from Persona 4 Golden was given a confidant with a unique card, and the same thing has happened again in Persona 5 Royal. Now, just because he's a man isn't the only reason I'm suspicious, because that would be sexist and that is wrong. But during the game's announcement, a small amount of information was revealed about Takuto and Kasumi's opinions on the Phantom Thieves. Kasumi thinks that they are unjust and controlling people is wrong, but Takuto believes the opposite and thinks the Phantom Thieves are good-natured and should be applauded for their heroism. Why does he feel this way? And why is it specifically mentioned that these two opinions are clashing? Is it because, as a counselor, he's sympathetic? 
and seen firsthand how sometimes vigilante justice is necessary to punish those outside of the police's power. Or perhaps another possibility, he is even more aware of the game between Igor and Yaudabaoth than we are led to believe, and that he's just waiting on the sidelines for his chance to put his piece into place. I don't know, just a thought. At the end of the day, these are just theories to get people thinking about the Persona games, and also try to point out how sometimes patterns need to be broken and changed to make an audience happy. Rarely are people thrilled to hear the same exact joke or story retold to them in a different way, and tedium can start to set in. If I manage to guess all the plot points of this game I've never played before, I know I'd be upset, but in some strange way I'd also be a little happy because that means I'm actually absorbing the content and messages the game is trying to send my way. Mostly, P5 is a picaresque story about the issues happening around Japan and how some are complacent in the way things are going. That's always been the core message of the game, and I don't think any new character getting added will change that. I'm not trying to switch the focus from that either, or hone in on whatever name Atlas decides to slap onto the big bad guy at the end of the game. This was really just a talk about a game series I love so much, that seamlessly incorporates so many elements of the human condition into a seemingly simple fool's journey through a year of his life. Also, yeah, she's totally evil. Did I convince you? Or not? I want to know, legitimately. Truth be told, this isn't the first time I've tried a video like this, but since my last one sucked, and seeing as the next game in the series is right around the corner, I wanted to get this video out as fast as I could, since it's only a matter of time until we find out whether any of my ideas at all were even remotely on the mark. Then yeah, that's basically all I had to say. I apologize for narrating in this fashion. It's, it's really hard to talk right now as I'm kind of sick, but seeing as the game literally came out as I finished my script for this video, I kind of had to hustle, so I appreciate you all for watching this video. Don't take it too seriously, and uh, yeah, I'm looking forward a lot to Persona 5. I can't wait to play it. I was playing it live stream it, but I got incredibly sick, so what are you going to do? The English version is still a long ways away, so maybe I'll wait out until that game releases. For those who are a fan of my original Persona 5 walkthrough, I will be playing Persona 5 Royal. Duh. Like, come on. <laughs> um, there were a lot of things I really didn't like about my original playthrough of the game, and I feel like I'm a lot better editing and commentating and all around just being stupider on the internet than I was when the game first released. And, uh, yeah. Thanks a lot for allowing me to entertain you guys for this long. This is probably the last Persona 5 breakdown analysis video thing I'm ever gonna make. We've been making them for almost four years now. It's kind of crazy, so this is kind of like my farewell letter to all of that, in a way. But yeah, thanks a lot, guys. Hope you enjoyed, and see you in the next video. Bye.